So with that, um, we will begin our question and answer session. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A chat, chat pod, and we will go ahead and get to as many as we can. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with Christiana. Christiana, how does a rare pediatric disease priority review voucher differ from pediatric exclusivity? Thanks for that question. A rare pediatric disease priority review voucher acts like a coupon. And if you have a product that meets the statutory criteria for a rare pediatric disease and it's a human drug application and any other statutory requirements, you get basically a coupon, a voucher, that you can submit with another drug application to get a priority review, which means the target deadline for review is six months. The pediatric exclusivity is a different statutory standard it's where the drug may produce a health benefit in children, and you get issued a written request. And if you fairly respond to the written request and other statutory requirements are met, then you can have six months of exclusivity, which is um, the ability to exclude others from uh, marketing or, in some cases, submitting an application for your drug as an incentive and a response for doing. Thank you. We have another question for you. Can a sponsor negotiate with FDA on elements <clears throat> of an FDA-issued written request, either before the sponsor needs to reply to the written request with yes or no by 180 days, or even after the written request is issued? For example, if the study cannot enroll or otherwise be conducted per the original term. The short answer is yes. If a sponsor receives a written request and would like to negotiate with FDA within the 180-day period, they may do that. If a sponsor receives a written request and accepts it, and then when studies begin, there are problems with enrollment or other challenges, then the sponsor can reach out to FDA. And if both parties agree, then the written request can be Great. Thank you. And now we have a question for Erin. Erin, if a sponsor obtained orphan drug designation for a 505B2 product in development and would like to ensure prior to filing the NDA that the specific wording of the indication that the sponsor is pursuing will qualify for seven-year orphan drug exclusivity upon product approval, should the sponsor obtain advice from the review division? Thank you for that question. Um, the short answer is yes, you should never hesitate to ask questions of the review division or directly to the Office of Orphan Products Development. Um, it, to the specifics of your question, in general, orphan designation covers the entire rare disease for which it's designated, which means that a uh, sponsor is typically, typically going to pursue an indication that falls within that rare disease. It's usually more narrow, or some people may call it a subset. Um, and the, the specifics of the wording of that indication typically should not matter for eligibility for orphan incentives such as exclusivity, because it would all fall within the, the overall rare disease for which the drug is designated. Now, in practice, that's not always exactly how it may happen. One reason that, that there may be a difference is is that orphan designation is granted extremely early in drug development, typically. It doesn't have to be, but typically. Um, and over time, over decades, our scientific understanding of diseases may evolve and change, and therefore certain terminology, wording, the grouping of how the disease is thought to be might change. And in those cases, it, it, it does help to talk to the review division, talk to OOPD, about whether the indication you're pursuing really does fall within the disease for which it's designated. Um, another example where you may want to double check is if the same drug is already approved for one indication within the rare disease and you're pursuing approval of a different indication within the rare disease, it could be helpful to ask to confirm that those indications are distinct and, and your indication would not be blocked.
Great, thank you, Erin. We have another question for you. Does orphan drug exclusivity allow for labeling carve-outs for approval of a product submitted in a 505B2? Thank you for that question. Um, the answer is yes, because overall, orphan drug exclusivity only blocks the same drug for the same indication. And therefore, if the same drug is up for approval, uh, orphan exclusivity should only block the particular indication. Um, so in that sense, the same drug could be approved for other indications that could be other diseases entirely or uh, other indications within the same rare disease. And therefore, carve-outs would apply. That essentially, the protected indication for which this competing drug uh, would be approved for, the orphan indication would be carved out. And at least from the orphan exclusivity perspective, the, the drug could be approved for other indications. Great, thank you. And our next question is for Catherine. Catherine, what is the de definition of serious infection for the purposes of a qualified infectious disease product? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, so to think about the meaning of serious or life-threatening infection for QIDP designation, FDA looked to similar wording for some of our other expedited programs, fast track, priority review, and breakthrough designation. And, and for those, FDA determined that a product is intended to treat a serious or life-threatening disease if it's intended to have an effect on a serious condition or a serious aspect of the condition. Um, and so that's how we look at, at the uh, QIDP designation for serious or life-threatening infections. Um, you know, one very clear example would be like hospital acquired bacterial pneumonia, um, but we've, we've granted designation for a variety of infections to date, and it's very helpful when we get QIDP designation requests if sponsors include in their request their rationale regarding why FDA would consider the uh, infection that it's intended to treat or prevent to be serious or life-threatening. Great, thank you. And we have another question for you. Would gain exclusivity apply to antibody drugs or COVID vaccines? Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, gain only applies to NDA. So no, um, gain exclusivity and QIDP designation would not apply to antibody drugs or vaccines that are submitted to the agency in ELA. Um, one more thing I wanted to add is that um, COVID-19 specifically is a viral infection, and so even if you did have a drug that you were developing to treat COVID-19, that falls outside of the scope of QIDP and GAIN, which is only for antibacterial and antifungal drugs. Great, thank you. And our next question is for Jonathan. Jonathan, to be eligible for CGT, there should not be more than one approved ANDA in the Orange Book. Is that correct? Yes, excellent question. Thank you. Um, so as far as inadequate generic competition goes, um, the definition there is there's not more than one approved drug product in the Orange Book. And so there's several situations that could result in not having more than one approved drug product in the orange book. Um, so you can have just the RLD in the orange book. Uh, you can have just an ANDA and the RLD has been discontinued. Um, and you've also got to remember that a drug product is a, a particular, it could be a particular strength. Um, so there could be multiple approved products in the active section of the orange book for a particular strength, um, but then one of the particular strengths, uh, there's only one in the active section. Uh, so there are various situations. So you got to remember it's one approved drug product in the active in the active section of the orange book. Great, thank you. And another question for you. 
Is approval of a second CGT designated application possible between the time of the first CGT approval and commencement of market? Yes, great question. Thank you. Um, so it is possible, and you have to remember here that exclusivity is the blocking mechanism. And to trigger CGT exclusivity, you have to commence commercial marketing. Uh, so within that 75-day period after approval of your application, you have to trigger your exclusivity by commencing commercial marketing. So once that uh, commercial marketing triggers the exclusivity, that's when the blocking mechanism kicks in. So if you were the first approved applicant and you waited um, 65 days after your approval to commence commercial marketing, you would run that risk in that time of having another CGT designated product approved. Um, so we've stressed in the guidance that you should be ready to commence commercial marketing uh, as soon as your application is approved. Great, thank you. Our next question is going to be from Mindy. Mindy, could you please elaborate on why the first filer prevents approval of other ANDAs? Is there anything in place to prevent? Thanks for the question. Um, so a first applicant, as that term is defined in the statute and which can be different from a, a quote first filer, um, might prevent the final approval of the subsequent applicant's ANDA if the first applicant is eligible for 180-day exclusivity. And the reason why is this, this patent challenge exclusivity is a function of the Hatch-Waxman amendments. Um, it's, it, it was added by Congress as an incentive to, to certain ANDA applicants who expose themselves to the risk of patent litigation by virtue of that paragraph 4 certification that has to be provided in order to qualify as a first applicant. Great, thank you. And we have another question for you. If two applicants file in paragraph four certify on the same patent on the same day, who is the first applicant? How do both applicants qualify? Um, thanks, yeah. So assuming both of those applicants submit substantially complete ANDAs with that paragraph four certification on the first day that a substantially complete ANDA was submitted with the paragraph 4 certification, then yes, both of those applicants may be considered as a first applicant. Great. And another question for you. Is it required that the first applicant obtain final approval before he waives the 180-day exclusivity in favor of a subsequent So um, in contract to relinquishment, a selective waiver can't occur until the exclusivity period is triggered. So the first applicant who was waiving would necessarily have received final approval. So I guess a, that was a long way of saying yes. <laughs> Great, thank you. And our next question is for Christiana. Christiana, can you explain a little more in detail on the process if the sponsor does not accept the written request within 180 days? Sure. It's a little bit complicated, but if there is remaining patent or exclusivity life, FDA will look at what we call the marketed drugs provision of PREA to see if there is an ability to require studies under PREA even if the drug is already marketed. If there is no remaining patent or exclusivity life, then FDA will refer the drug to NIH um, uh, to be potentially put on the list of priority needs um, in pediatric therapeutics, which the NIH, um, in consultation with the FDA, develops and publishes and revises every three years. And one outcome of that process is the drug could be a candidate for contract or grants um, such that people could bid on the ability to, to study the drug under that. Great, thank you. And another question, what is the difference between a PPSR under BPCA and an IPSP under PREA in terms of purpose? And and That's a good question. So 
The pediatric exclusivity program under BPCA is entirely voluntary. A PPSR is a submission from a sponsor to the FDA that can be submitted at any time during drug development that communicates to FDA that the sponsor wants a written request and explains what studies it's prepared to do and why it should get a written request. An IPSP, an initial pediatric study plan under PREA, is required. For drugs that trigger PREA, they all have to have an IPSP submitted to the agency as part of the PREA process. Under the statute under PREA, they are typically submitted at the end of phase two meeting, or excuse me, um, after the end of phase two meeting or um, such other time as FDA and the sponsor agree. And the IPSP will contain a lot of information, including the studies that they plan to do, any plans for requesting deferral or requesting waiver of pediatric studies, et cetera. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Erin. Erin, how long does it take OOPD to make an orphan drug exclusivity determination? Is there a standard time or does it vary by case? Also, does OOPD notify the sponsor directly or do sponsor, does the sponsor and public need to look at the OOPD website or Orange Book to see whether a product was granted? Thank you for the question. Uh, so the Office of Orphan Products Development, OOPD, makes orphan exclusivity determinations after a product is approved, after the application is approved, the NDA or BLA. Uh, the amount of time it takes to make those determinations varies case by case. Cases that raise complex legal questions or questions about clinical superiority often take uh, longer to review and come to a conclusion about. Um, I saw another question out there related to whether the data that we consider can be generated after approval. So even though we make orphan exclusivity determinations after the approval, we make those determinations based on information in the application, the, the NDA or BLA. Um, Oftentimes, if there's complex issues, especially related to clinical superiority, we, we will reach out to the sponsor and see if they have any arguments that they want to make for why they're eligible for exclusivity. Um, but those arguments should be based on information and evidence included in the application um, or on rare occasions referencing uh, articles or, or other information they want us to consider. However, we will not consider information generated after uh, the approval, such as you know, starting a, a clinical trial after approval in order to demonstrate clinical superiority. Um, and, and on the last part of the question, OOPD does notify the sponsor when we've made a determination that the drug is either eligible or not eligible for exclusivity. That is posted to the, to the website. Uh, and the orange book when it is eligible for exclusivity, but FD or OOPD will send a letter to the sponsor. Great, thank you, Erin. Our next question is for Jonathan. Jonathan, is patent exclusivity considered blocking when it comes to CGT if it is carved out from the label? Great question, thank you. Um, so it's important to remember here when you're talking about exclusivity, uh, I answered in a previous question uh, about CGT designation and inadequate generic competition, uh, and, your, and it could be designated as a CGT. So then when you're looking at exclus exclusivity, it's important to remember the criteria to qualify for that and being a first approved applicant uh, for a drug product that has no unexpired patents or exclusivities. Um, so you're not able to do a paragraph four statement or a section eight carve out or those kind of things on CGT. It's really intended uh, for drugs that have no competition. It's not sort of a, there's no way to work around the patents and exclusivities. Um, so no, you're not able to, to do that uh, for CGT. It doesn't meet the criteria. 
for CTT exclusivity. Great, thank you, Jonathan. And we have one last question and it is for Mindy. Mindy, how often is the P4 list updated? Thanks, um, so typically the list is updated about twice a month. Great, thank you, Mindy. And thank you to all of our presenters for taking time out of your day to answer all these questions.